I knew from the time that I was 19 years old that I wanted to be in the fight business. What the f*** does that even mean? <laughs> what does being in the fight business mean? What if I told you that this guy... Dana White. Dana White. Mr. Dana White. Dana White, president of the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Turned a failing illegal business? Not only would commissions not sanction it, in a couple places it was actually illegal. The old owner said, well, I'll just go to places where you can't get me. That's f illegal. Into a multi-billion dollar sports empire. You watch interviews of me from day one. I'm like, this thing's gonna be the biggest sport in the world. Everybody watches the Super Bowl. We wanna make this. The Super Bowl of mixed martial arts. 3.6 billion from, from 2 million. And everybody's like, wow, that's the greatest investment in the history of mankind. That's unbelievable. Wow, that's really inspiring. So everybody must love him. Let me tell you the rest of the story. UFC fighters are just underpaid considering how much money the Zufa makes. And you say that the UFC punishes fighters? We are on par with all the other sports uh, leagues out there. We're claiming that the UFC is both a monopoly and a monopsony. The mob hates him. Two guys showed up and said I owed him 2500 bucks. He said you got till tomorrow to pay us. You probably hate him. I don't give a f I mean, even his mom hates him. I don't like the person Dana's become. It's terrible the way he speaks of women and treats women. When are we gonna see women in the uh, UFC, man? Never. Look, if you came here looking for a cookie cutter success story, you came to the wrong place. When we bought it, it wasn't allowed on pay-per-view. Right. Venues did not want the UFC at their arena. We're 30 something million dollars in the hole. Nobody would put the UFC live on TV. I love adversity. The UFC was a disaster navigating crime, politics, and greed. Well, eventually Senator John McCain stepped in and talked the cable companies into pulling the plug on it. What it was at the beginning was human cockfighting. It was. You'd bring up UFC and you'd just get this visceral reaction like, oh my God, you're involved in that. Why do we keep hearing about the underpaying stuff? UFC has officially been sold for $4 billion. And no matter what you think of Dana White, everything that comes out of your mouth is stupid. And I'm going to beat the shit out of you. He's not um, a good person. He seems to have lost his character somewhere along the way. I'm coming for the money, you piece of shit. Two-faced, hypocritical sack of shit. He really needs a psychologist or a shrink or something to make him see all of that. The person he's become from the person he used to be. If you'd give me just a few minutes of your time, I'll convince you that not only is the growth of the UFC the most impossible success story ever. This business is so massive because it doesn't matter what color you are, what country you come from, or what language you speak. We're all human beings and fighting's in our DNA, man. We get it and we like it. If a fight broke out over there right now, this whole place would stand up and we'd stand here and we'd watch the fight until it was over. The one thing that I believe worked would work everywhere is fighting. I don't think anybody has, has built and accomplished what what Dana has. This story's crazy. I don't even know if I've ever told this story before. But that Dana White, with all his controversies, was the only guy who could make this happen. I'll, I'll tell you the story, how, how it began. No, I'll tell you how the story began. It's a tournament. It's an eight-man single elimination tournament. It's 1993. Two businessmen named Bob Meyerowitz and Art Davey partner with jiu-jitsu master Horian Gracie to launch the Ultimate Fighting Challenge. Well, they put on their first pay-per-view, and it was huge. You look at the numbers for that first event. You had almost 4,000 people in attendance in Denver that night, but the pay-per-views over 86,000. It rivaled the WWE and big boxing events at the time. Those numbers were a shock because everyone thought we were only going to do maybe 40 to 50. Doing 86,000 that first time immediately said that we were a hit. So they did what any good businessman would do. It was supposed to be one event. Now let me show you what we're going to do. They did it again. Pay-per-view went up to almost 125,000. The numbers were great. So you're damn right they were putting on another event. They just kept pumping out more shows. And we kept growing. So by UFC 5, we did almost 300,000 buys with the super fight with Hoist and Shamrock. Over the next seven years, the UFC became more and more popular. It signified that what you've seen before, ladies and gentlemen, was not what you're gonna see now. We've entered a new era. But there was a problem. There was a horrible stigma attached to the UFC back then. The only thing people remembered about the UFC was the no rules days. But whether bad or good, you knew what the UFC was. Groin punching, hair pulling, headbutting, all of that was allowed. So the UFC was kind of this crazy thing where it was like no rules, bare knuckle. McCain came out and said, what it was at the beginning was human cockfighting. It was. This is human cockfighting here. Human cockfighting. Human cockfighting. It's sort of like human cockfighting in my view. It's barbaric. Nobody wants to see it. There's no rules. And ultimate fighting. And the old owner of the UFC said, 
I'll do whatever you want to do. I want to do. You can't tell me what to do. Over the course of 29 events, both public perception and the political backlash forced the UFC's reputation down the drain. You bring up UFC and you just get this visceral reaction like, oh my God, you're involved in that. There were no time limits. There were no rules, no regular. I mean, it was kind of craziness, almost like watching a car wreck. It's like once you get that stigma, once you get get that name associated with you, it's all anybody associated with, with the brand or with the business. So it was a tremendous uphill battle. You know, the image, you know, fighting in a cage. Everybody goes, well, what are you, crazy? This many people want to see a freak show. This many people want to see a real sport. You can't put on these unregulated fights with no athletic commission. These guys never thought they were creating a sport. The UFC was no longer on TV, so no more income from pay-per-view. Well, eventually, Senator John McCain stepped in and talked the cable companies into pulling the plug on them. They have a huge problem with censorship. You know, a lot of the cable companies are keeping it from being aired. So now, the cable companies wouldn't put them on pay-per-view. The ATM machine was cut off. These banned events were now held in the middle of nowhere, so no more ticket sales. The old owner said, well, I'll just go to places where you can't get me which is nowhere. So this guy would go to Alabama, Puerto Rico, places where there was no athletic commission. And if you were at the event, there was nothing else to spend money on. So we ended up going to our first UFC event. And we'd walk in and there would be, it was nothing that what we expected. There was no energy in the crowd. I wanted to buy a program. They didn't have a program. I wanted to buy a t-shirt. You can buy a t-shirt. And we sat in the crowd and started to go, man, imagine if they did this and imagine if they did that. This business just isn't being run the right way. Do this the right way. Build this like a real sport and these are real athletes. This thing could be big. And he was absolutely right, but with a business mind like that, why the f was Dana White still handling luggage? I worked at the Boston Harbor Hotel, ended up at the Boston Harbor Hotel, I was a bellman there. But I was 19, I was standing in that lobby and I was just like, man, I, I hate this job and I don't, this isn't me. The one thing that I realized young is I didn't want to work for anybody else. I wanted to work for myself. Dana inherited that drive from his mother and his tough skin from his father. Yeah, I don't talk a lot about my upbringing. He doesn't speak about me very often, you know, and when he does, it's very short and brief. But I understand your parents got divorced when you were really young. My mom, I grew up with a single mom um, who worked very hard. You know, I definitely got my work ethic from her. My mother was a, uh, was a nurse and we lived back back east in Massachusetts. Our family was very close. We did a lot of things together. My mom and I didn't have a very good relationship, but my mom worked hard. She gave us the best life she could give us. I really did work like 80, 100 hours a week. I don't know how she did it sometimes, yeah, how man. she pulled it off as a single mom with a, with a dad that didn't pay anything and didn't care. My mother used to tell me that I was gonna, uh, that I was gonna be just like my father and not amount to anything. My dad was an alcoholic. He wasn't a bad guy. Uh, he was just a selfish guy. Was never around, and when he did show up, you didn't want him around. My dad wanted to party and do his things and, and never really uh, cared about me and my sister. But I wouldn't, I, I honestly wouldn't change one thing about the way that I grew up. If, if I didn't grow up the way that I did, I wouldn't be who I am today. I 100% firmly believe that. While working as a Boston bellhop, Dana picks up boxing as a hobby with Peter Welch as his mentor. There was a guy named Peter Welch in Boston, and this guy was a, a legend. Street fighting and boxing. This was the type of dude at the time that you didn't seek him out. You didn't, this is the guy you went looking for. I sought him out and I said, I know this is weird, you don't know me, but I want, I want to work under you. I want you to teach me everything you know about fighting. And what's even crazier is he took me in. So you end up uh, teaching boxer size classes in Boston. Everybody says that I was a box aerobics trainer. That's what everybody <laughs> said I was. And what we did was we started this get kids off the street program. It's, it's a great thing to do for the kids, but you don't make much money doing it. It was, you know, it was a charity thing that we had done. So to pay the bills, we used to bring in businessmen, housewives, whoever it was, and train them to box. And it was basically, we were like personal trainers. Teaching boxing classes on the side fueled Dana's love for the fight business. What about the fight business was drawing you? I loved everything about the fight business. I knew from the time that I was 19 years old that I wanted to be in the fight business. I didn't care what aspect of it it was. You know, I was a big Ali fan, then became a huge Tyson fan. So I was always attracted to the fight business. As far back as I can ever remember, all I wanted to do was be in the fight business. But the job also attracted some nasty enemies. I was doing business back there. I was training people out of a gym. And our classes became huge. And one day I'm actually in there teaching a class. A couple of dudes that worked for Whitey showed up. Uh, the crew of the notorious Boston gangster and longtime fugitive Whitey Bulger pay you a visit. And these guys literally walk right into the middle of the class. So we need to talk to him. He said I owed him 2,500 bucks. And, and, and uh, we're looking for some money. 
that I couldn't pay them. You know, 2,500 bucks, I was 21 years old. You might as well ask me for 25,000. Right. I didn't have 2,500 bucks. What do you do? I ignored them. I didn't do anything. And then one day I was sitting in my apartment and I got a phone call. They said, you got till tomorrow to pay us. We want the money. And I said, I don't have the money. You got till tomorrow at one o'clock to give us the money. And I'm like, or what? Or are you gonna find out? I didn't want to find out what the or would be. So I literally hung up the phone. I called Delta. Bought a plane ticket and came back to Vegas. Those guys did me the biggest favor of all time. I came out here and planted my flag and started doing my own thing and started to work my way up. Ignoring the mob and escaping to Vegas was a pretty big gamble on Dana's part. And as you'll soon come to learn, it has a tremendous payout. Almost as tremendous as the payout you could receive for using mybookie.ag. That's right, if you use promo code Lionel the next time you use mybookie.ag for a stellar pay-per-view like UFC 296 or afterward, you'll get a cash bonus of up to 200 bucks on your first deposit. That's free money to bet on your favorite fighters like Colby Chaos Coving or Leon Rocky Edwards. And the best part is that it's only a one-time rollover and with MyBookie's early cash out feature, if four legs of your five leg parlay already hit, you can cash out early for immediate profit or use the funds on another bet. So let's say you got a parlay of Ian Gary, Patty Pimblett, Shafkat Rachmanov, Alessandri Pantoja, and Leon Edwards to win. If three or four fights hit and you want to cash out early, you can do that or let it ride for a big payday. Click the link in the description and use code Lionel to win big at UFC 296 or any UFC. UFC event. Remember, you can bet anything, anywhere, anytime with my bookie. And now back to Dana. So now Dana's a new resident of Sin City, but still stays involved in fighting by working at a boxing gym. There were a couple of big boxing gyms here in town that, that, that were popping at the time. And I ended up at a place called United Champions. The fitness side of it was for me to have the ability to make money mm -hmm. and stay in the sport and learn everything that I could about the sport. You know, where we trained fighters and, and peop, you guys like you could come in and work out. What's interesting is that Dana was so focused on the business that he wouldn't even attend his friend's weddings. I didn't go to anybody's wedding. Why? I'm, I, I'm too busy. This. Yeah, I don't have time for that kind of But there was one guy he couldn't say no to. This guy used to pick me up every day and drive me to school. He'd have to get up earlier to get ready for school, to drive all the way over to my house, pick me up and drive me to school every day. This dude's getting married. There's no f***ing way I'm not going to his wedding. And it kind of sounds crazy to say this, but without this wedding, there is no UFC. So I end up going to his wedding. Who do I run into? Lorenzo and Frank Fertitta. I haven't seen them since and, high school. And we hadn't seen each other in about six or seven years. That's where we reconnected. Dana reconnects with his childhood friends, Lorenzo and Frank Fertitta. They approached me at the wedding and they said, hey, we heard you're doing this boxing thing. He informed me that uh, he had been training some boxers. I would love to come over and train with you. And Lorenzo and I had always said we were gonna do something together in boxing. Lorenzo comes Monday to train with me. We've been together ever since. We right. don't go to that wedding. We definitely don't bump into each other and we don't see each other. Uh -huh. We changed the f***ing world totally, man. because we went to that wedding. Aside from being friends with Dana, the Fertitas are savvy businessmen with deep pockets. The Fertitta brothers are both worth about a billion dollars each. And if you really know the history of the Fertitas and what they've built and what they've done, incredible businessmen. <laughs> the Fertitta brothers own Station Casinos in Las Vegas, which is the third or fourth largest gaming company in the country. The one thing that's made this thing successful has been the relationship between me and the Fertitas. And the three amigos bonded over their shared love of the UFC, so much so that they began training jujitsu together. It wasn't until Frank Fertitta and I were out one night at the Hard Rock here in Vegas. Uh, we saw a guy named John Lewis, and he was a UFC fighter. And he was a jujitsu guy who had the only jujitsu school here in Vegas. So Frank says to me, I've always wanted to learn the ground game. I've always wanted to learn jujitsu. I said, me too. I said, I know this guy. Let, we'll go talk to him. And we set up a lesson for Monday to, to start taking jujitsu. Me, Frank, and Lorenzo went to our first jujitsu lesson with, with John Lewis. And we were blown away by it. And that was really my introduction to this, this world that we now live in. And after that, we became addicted to it. We started training three, four days a week. We'd all try to learn more than the other ones so we could submit them next time we wrestled. And while training jujitsu, Dana was introduced to two random UFC fighters. Then we started to meet some of the fighters. And then we were blown away by the fighters. These guys were smart. They were incredible athletes. And for whatever reason, some of these guys start gravitating toward me and want me to manage them. Right. I started representing some of the UFC guys. So I start managing Chuck and Tito. At that time, 
the UFC didn't even want Chuck Liddell. I was trying to get the UFC to sign Chuck Liddell at that time. Managing these up-and-comers was smart. It ingrained Dana in the fight business, so much so that the owner of a different fight promotion wanted to hire Dana to run it. So he calls me and says, I want you to run the WFA. I want you to come in and take this over, and I want you to run this company. I'm gonna give you a house, I'm gonna pay you 200,000, I want you to come in and run this company for me. So I call Lorenzo, and I said, I just got this offer to run the WFA. And he's like, what the f I thought you and I were gonna do something together. I said, I'm wow. out. Dana turned down the biggest offer of his life up to that point, so he needed to believe that something big was coming. I sh you not, two weeks, three weeks later, I'm on a call, with Bob Meyerowitz, the owner of the UFC. I got into a huge contract battle with the old owner, Bob Meyerowitz, over Tito's contract. They had screwed Tito over on some money and stuff, so I'm trying to get the money back, and I'm trying to get Chuck into the UFC. And through that, I found out that the UFC was in trouble. I was talking about pay-per-view, and he flipped out. He says, there is no money. I don't even know if I have enough money to put on the next event. And I was screaming at me, and I hung up the phone, and I was like, damn. And I was like, holy shit, this thing's in trouble. Lorenzo and I were gonna get involved in boxing, they were down in Miami. I called them and said, I just got off the phone with Bob Meyerowitz. I said, the UFC's in trouble. It was basically going out of business. I think we could buy the UFC and I think we should do it. So I connected Lorenzo with Bob Meyerowitz. They started talking. So I called Bob, literally cold called him and said, hey, this is Lorenzo. He remembered who I was. Lorenzo calls Bob Meyerowitz and the negotiation starts. Two months later, three months later, Lorenzo ends up buying the UFC. We, we owned the company for $2 million. And all of a sudden, we owned a business that we knew nothing about. How was the deal structured between the three of you? So the brothers put up the money. Uh -huh. They bought it, two million bucks. Him and Frank call me over and they're like, we want you to be the president of the company and we want you to run it. They made me the president of the company and they gave me 10%. And that may sound like the deal of the century, but there was nobody celebrating that purchase. Did anyone say, man, why are you throwing your money away? Everybody. It sounds like almost nobody believed in you. Nobody believed in this thing. Uh -huh. When I say nobody, except for two guys, Frank and Lorenzo, that's it. It was a business that they 100% believed in. I mean, why would, they take a, why would they take a chance on this? They believed in it. So three long lost friends bought a failing cage fighting promotion and unsurprisingly got very little in return. We bought the three letters UFC, which the trademark really wasn't even that strong at the time, and an old wooden octagon. And like 12 or 13 contracts. Bob Meyerowitz, to keep this thing alive, had stripped everything, all the ancillary things that go around the UFC were sold off. He sold away the video game rights, the DVD rights, the merchandise rights, and all the old library was owned by Lionsgate. If there was anything worth a penny connected with those three letters UFC, he sold it. It didn't stop there. They didn't even own a company website. We didn't even own UFC.com. UFC.com used to be user-friendly computers. You know, all the rights and the trademarks and all the things that, that you need to build a brand were gone. And I had to go out there and battle to try to get these things back. So not only does Dana have to repair the brand, but he has to make sure people can actually watch UFC. We knew to make this successful, we had to get this thing on television. When we bought it, it wasn't allowed on pay-per-view. You as a grown adult didn't have the option to buy this thing on pay-per-view. is on pay-per-view. We weren't allowed on pay-per-view. That was the mountain that we had to climb. Nobody wanted to put it on TV, and all the people who liked MMA were already watching Pride. These guys come out and they just start throwing money around and start trying to be the UFC. Pride keeps rant, rant, rant. They're gonna come to America and they're gonna take over, they're gonna crush the UFC. I've been coming back and forth for seven years, challenging Pride and Pride fighters to fight the UFC. So a fan base existed, Dana just needed to make the turn from barbaric cage fighting to a legitimate sport. Not only would commissions not sanction it, in a couple places it was actually illegal. One of the other things that people probably don't think about that didn't want us was venues did not want the UFC at their arena. They didn't want anything to do with the UFC. They didn't even want to waste five minutes of their time to talk about the UFC or meet with me. Every day when I came in here, it was war. The first step was making this a legal sporting event. The hard part was gonna be getting this thing sanctioned by the athletic commissions. The last person on earth you want to butt heads with is the government. You can't mess with the government. And that's that's where Lorenzo Fertitta comes in. So Lorenzo was a, a former regulator himself. He, yeah. he was the head of the Nevada State Athletic Commission. So you met with the Nevada and New Jersey Athletic Commissions to create a set of unified rules. We went to these, to these state athletic commissions and said, 
This is a real sport. These guys are real athletes. You know, making sure that the fighters are taken care of, the, the doctors, you're going through the proper medical testing. Making sure that you have enough money to pay these fighters when the fight is over. This was a massive step forward, but they didn't stop there. I thought the problem with the UFC was that it didn't have its distribution platform, meaning it wasn't on pay-per-view. We had to go out there and cut deals with DirecTV, Dish, and in-demand pay-per-view. By the end of the year, Dana got the UFC back on pay-per-view starting with UFC 33. Let's see. Now's the time that we gotta dig in and work harder than we ever did. And he meant it because now he had to force people to realize that this was a sport. The sport had evolved, yet the consumer hadn't evolved. We wanted to, to uh, educate people on this amazing sport. We were back on pay-per-view, we were trying to market a sport and the world wasn't ready for this to be a sport yet. Old UFC advertising was about violence, blood, and danger. The marketing for this thing was two men enter the cage, one man uh, leaves, you know, the most barbaric, bloody sport. Like somebody's gonna die. But if you went out on the street and started talking to, you know, everyday regular people that have never seen the UFC, they'd be like, that's that crazy stuff where people die and, you know, but it's not the truth. You know, it was all marketing and hype. It was basically old marketing by the old owners just to make it sound crazy. Dana flipped the narrative around to humanize the sport. The reality was there'd never been a death or serious injury in the UFC. If you met these athletes, they're incredible people. They're great athletes. I mean, they have like Olympic gold medalists and world jiu-jitsu champions and, mm -hmm. and boxers. These guys are college educated. Mm -hmm. They're family men, they're good guys. Soon, the UFC attracted sponsors, they had sustainable DVD releases, and their live gates improved because of event deals with casinos. We can't get a venue. Donald Trump actually says, come to the Taj. We did the Trump Taj Mahal. Our first two shows were there. In 2002, Dana struck a deal with Fox to get the UFC on cable television, starting with UFC 37 and a half. We always believed we had to get this onto free television. It, to me, it's the most exciting, most fantastic sport in the world. I couldn't be more excited to have it on network television. When Fox came in, and Fox was the deal that I always wanted. Like when we signed the Fox deal, the first thing everybody started saying to me when we signed the Fox deal is, you did it. You're mainstream now. That changed the game. UFC fights and more importantly, highlights were far more accessible to fans. We needed to get our content out there and they spread our content across all their platforms. And Dana's hard work culminated at UFC 40 where the UFC sold out the MGM Grand Arena and sold 150,000 pay-per-view buys. Almost 15,000 people here screaming at the top of their lungs. I think this is the event that pushes us over the edge and gains mainstream acceptance. That may sound exaggerative, but after struggling for the first two years of business, you could make the argument that UFC 40 kept the UFC afloat. It was the greatest night in UFC history. I'm glad we could share it together. But the greatest night didn't mean much because by 2004, Dana and the Fertitas were in serious trouble. We're 30 something million dollars in the hole. How do you put so much into something that is so unknown? We bought it for $2 million. They invested another 44 into it. When do we pull the plug on this thing? Is this thing gonna work? Dana and the Fertitas basically call it quits. The lowest point was um, when Lorenzo called me and said, I can't ask my brother to keep writing these checks. I can't keep doing this, man. We're bleeding money. And there's no end in sight. This could easily turn into a hundred million dollars uh, real quick. I needed to get out there and find out what we could sell this thing for right now. And I said, you know, do you know anybody? Who do you think, you know, could potentially buy this thing? I started making calls all that day. He makes this call to me and I tell him the number. Six, maybe eight million. He said, all right, I'll call you tomorrow. I wanna to go home. I wanna think about this. I wanna sleep on it. And I don't wanna make a, a quick rash decision on anything. And so at that point, when you go to bed that night, is the UFC over? Yeah, I'm thinking that this thing's close to, if it's not over right now, we're close. But it's a really good thing Lorenzo slept on the idea. Anybody who does anything great goes off their gut. Literally calls me the next morning, seven and one says, and I think in his gut, he woke up the next day and said, I'm not ready to tap out. I'm not ready to give in. F it, let's keep going. We were this close to pulling the plug on this thing. You guys, so you're still 40 million in the hole. You think, God, if we could just get this thing in front of more people, it could win. We said, we need to come up with a reality show. Dana and the Fertitas come up with the brilliant idea to passively make you a fan of the sports with the reality TV show called The Ultimate Fighter. All these guys live in a house. For those of you that don't know, they're coached by two big stars in the UFC. At the end of every episode, there's a live fight. You lose, you get eliminated. Two guys fight in the finale. One guy becomes the open fighter and gets a contract with the UFC. But the problem was nobody wanted anything to do with this weird UFC show. We start pitching it to all the networks. We go out and we start pitching this thing and nobody wants it. This isn't gonna work. Well, we can't put this on our network. This was something that was banned and marketed as the brutal most violent sport in the world. Nobody would put 
the UFC live on TV. But Dana and the Fertitas made an offer a certain network couldn't refuse. There's this new network that just started at the time called Spike TV. The network for men. We meet with these guys and we pitch them on the idea for the ultimate fighter. They don't like it. They couldn't wait to get the f out of this meeting. <laughs> they didn't believe in it. So the Fertitas come back and say, well, what if we pay for it? We'll put up the $10 million to produce this show. We'll give you it. We'll give it to you. Just put it on the air. You guys air it for free. They like that idea a lot better. They let us buy our way onto Spike TV. So this is the last $10 million that the Fertitas are going to invest in the UFC. If this doesn't work, it's over. Okay. So they rolled the dice on this last ditch effort to save the sport, and all they could do was hope it landed. We air the first season of The Ultimate Fighter. We threw this thing on Spike TV with zero advertising. I have the feeling that some guys here that don't want to fight. The first episode pulled 1.3 million viewers. Do you want to be a fighter? That's the question. And this thing just starts to go like this. Yeah. And then it started to build, and it started to build. Every week, the ratings were going up. The ratings were through the roof. Um, on this network that nobody had ever heard of. By the fifth episode, yeah. we're pulling 2.3, 2.4 million viewers. Killer numbers, you know what I mean? Blowing anything they had on the network out of the water. It's the biggest home run ever. But despite the success of the first few episodes, there was a massive problem. That first season of The Ultimate Fighter was a nightmare. They fired the president of the network halfway through the season. Everything shuts down, man, meaning no contact. Spike TV whatsoever. There were literally people hiding in their cubicles over there because they didn't know who was going to get fired next. They had made all these promises to me and everything else. I start flying to New York and I'm waiting in the lobby of Spike TV and they won't even see me. It was so f***ed up, so dysfunctional and such a mess. We still don't have a deal for a season two or any of that. Without a network deal for a second season, the temporary bump in UFC popularity could instantly vanish. This season needed to deliver all the way to the final second. It literally went right down to the wire. So we get into the finale. We have no deal. Diego Sanchez fought Kenny Florian. Comes out and annihilates him in a minute. Terrible. We, we've got two hours of programming to fill. I'm like, oh my God, Th this is a nightmare. But the savior, Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin. Forrest Griffin and Stefan Bonner go out and put on that fight. And they put on the sickest fight you have ever seen in your life. And the numbers during the fight went just like this. And that this was live? Was, yeah. And this is before social media or any of that stuff. People were stomping their feet and, and it sounded like a train was going through the arena. And at the end of the fight, people were chanting one more round, one more round. And then on the cuff, I go in there and on the fly, give them both contracts and the place goes crazy. When that fight ended, we knew we had something special. We knew it was, it was a done deal. We did it. We made it. We were going somewhere. That fight saved the UFC from bankruptcy and made it okay to love mixed martial arts. The Spike guys literally pulled us out into the alley. We were in an alley out by the Cox Pavilion and we did a f deal on a napkin. They said, we'll buy the next season, we'll pay you X. Literally written on a napkin, the new deal for our new deal on Spike TV. If that first season didn't happen, I would not be sitting here right now. And with that, the UFC's pay-per-view numbers exploded. We knew it, we felt it, now we're on TV, we're starting to see a difference in pay-per-view buys. In 2006, you end up setting pay-per-view records, I think nearly $223 million. The UFC was unbanned and regulated across the US, and more seasons of The Ultimate Fighter built stars and drew more pay-per-views. We start uh, cutting the fighters in on a piece of the pay-per-view. I want to pay them as much as we possibly can, that's a sign of success. And the UFC UFC started dominating the competition. I think the aggression has got us to where we are today. Is WEC merging with the UFC? Yes. The Ultimate Fighting Championship and World Extreme Cage Fighting have merged. The biggest mistake that everybody makes when they try to compete with us is they try to compete with us. The UFC bought this company called Pride. The only two companies in this world that matter are the UFC and Pride. The UFC has purchased Strikeforce. Is that true? That is true. And it is the biggest story in mixed, mixed martial arts. It is the acquisition of Strikeforce by UFC. Pride and Strikeforce were both great purchases, and so was the WEC. These acquisitions brought in a ton of your favorite fighters, expanded the UFC's library of content, and made it pretty much the leader in the sport. Somebody's mom might even call this a monopoly. I do believe they have a monopoly. I don't know how anyone could think they don't. I've heard the word monopoly thrown out. We're claiming that the UFC is both a monopoly and a monopsony. You have to prove that they intentionally, knowingly took these illegal steps with the purpose being to wipe everybody else out. That's a tall order. We have faith in our claim. Anyone that starts to even be up and coming at all 
or poses any kind of a threat or they're fighters or employees go to work from someone else, they buy them out or they drive them out. Dana's tight grip on the MMA market has always been one of his biggest criticisms. When people say that, oh, they went in and they, they bought pride, they bought strike force, they, they bought this, they bought that. You see anybody buying us? And you say that the UFC punishes fighters? They say, you want to leave? Or we're going to strip you or sue you or seek an injunction. The UFC is basically the only league and the only team. UFC is in a position to where essentially who they say is the best is who the public perceives as the best. And nobody ever wants to look at themselves as a feeder league to the UFC. UFC has kind of made it known. We don't mind if you're there as long as you admit you are there as a feeder to us. Deal with it. You're all feeder leagues to the UFC. And the critiques don't stop there. Dana famously didn't want women to fight in this promotion. There's a famous TMZ clip. Yeah. Right uh, when are we going to see women in the uh, UFC, man? Never. It's terrible the way he speaks of women and treat, treats women. And you have to understand at the point in time when I said that, we were trying to get people to accept men fighting in a cage. Right. There weren't enough talented girls fighting to create an entire division. Dana also very clearly has champions he loves and champions he doesn't care for. You ask fans if they want to see Woodley fight again, I think that would be a flat out no. Randy Couture comes off as the greatest guy in the world, Captain America, he's the furthest thing from it. And I'm happy to not be in business with him anymore. The stuff between Tito and I is very real. You know, this is no bullshit. We're not trying to, you know, put on a WWE show. Francis wants to take zero risks. Doesn't want to take any chances. Um, and he obviously didn't want to take a chance against John Jones. You got it. You got the hand it to you. You got Dana White privilege. Uh, don't. <laughs> There's no reason to be that mean and cruel to people all the time. Not to mention, Dana White's personality is, to put it mildly, an acquired taste. First of all, whoever gave you that quote is a put. He's not um, a good person. He seems to have lost his character somewhere along the way. Everything that comes out of your mouth is stupid. He is a lion, two-faced, hypocritical sack of shit. You know what you get with me. If I said it, I mean it, and that's it. We're all adults here. Bob Arum is a piece of shit. I'm coming for the money, you piece of shit. When's the last time you saw a fight promoter sit at the podium in the press conference after the fight and say, you know what? That fight tonight sucked. I'm sorry. What are you going to do? I think the main event was terrible. I'm blown away that George St. Pierre won that fight. And listen, I'm a promoter. He's the biggest pay-per-view star on, on the planet for me. And I still don't think he won that fight. And yes, I swear. And things like that. So do you. And so do they when they're home. Who cares? I, I don't care. Because I don't give a fuck about you. Do you think? That's the beauty of what Dana is, you know? He he's, has no filter, and I think that the fans really appreciate that. But by far, Dana White's greatest criticism is greed. Why do we keep hearing about the underpaying stuff? When I was in the UFC, when I fought for the World Championship at 135, I was still working a full-time job. Let's say there was $42 million in revenue. Cut that in more than half because you're partners with the cable companies. Sure. And then we put on all the other all the production ourselves, and the list goes on and on and on of all the costs. You laughed when the number 8% of revenue um, was going to the athletes, when, when that number was thrown on the table. UFC fighters are just underpaid considering how much money that Zufa makes. I can tell you that there is a number of guys that make well into the millions every single year. I made, what, $14,000. Is that what you made to fight for the world title at 135? Yes, that's well, it's it's, it's all public record, so. God damn. Um, and then that's why that's I- That's depressing. Do, do you think there's a point where, you know, you talk about your competition being the NFL, the Major League Baseballs, the NBAs, NASCARs of the world, where the top salaries of your top stars are in line with those in the other sports? Our numbers line up with sports our size. If I told you what the top salaries were with our stars, you'd be blown away. My knockouts alone are worth 50k US alone. That's the knockouts. We, we bonus these guys big checks, plus there's bonuses built into the fights for best fight of the night, knockout of the night, KO of the night. It's exactly because of the control that they exert. So much of these guys pay is discretionary. It's not even contractual at all. Trust me when I tell you these guys are making a lot of money. Um, from a fighter pay standpoint, I'm proud of what we pay fighters. Um, I'm broke, so I need to fight. And we are on par with all the other sports uh, leagues out there. Fighters would be certainly better off if there was more competition. If you take a look at, at our um, average um, undercard payroll relative to, say, a boxing pay-per-view undercard, we're paying out 
upwards of eight times more money for our undercard versus a pay-per-view boxing undercard. We get into all this money and the stuff that's going on right now. Everybody acts like this is a career. This isn't a career. This is not a, a career. This is an opportunity. And you don't see those, those guys and girls and we all know who we're talking about, the, the top earners complain about their money. I'm by no means insensitive to Dana White's greed. In fact, I'll be blunt. Dana, you keep demonetizing my content. I could care less. This is the fight business. Well, it's hard for me to keep making these videos if I can't reinvest in the channel. Who gives a shit? Well, my subscribers care, and I've got YouTube memberships for them to show their support. If you're that stupid and somebody else wants to do it, Knock yourself out. Look, old man, this viewer is about to subscribe. Don't insult my community. I don't give a f Don't give a f Look, I'm sure you don't, but nothing you say is gonna hurt my feelings. You know how stupid you have to be to even think something like that, let alone say it publicly and act like you're serious. Dana White's got no shortage of criticisms, but to be fair, we have to highlight perhaps one of the greatest showcases of business leadership ever. We went through COVID. Stay at home, that is the order tonight from four state governors. The number of cases soaring just today, 2020, is now the deadliest year in U.S. history. COVID was the hardest thing that I've ever done in my career. Despite all the criticism to come, Dana refused to let his business die, leave his employees penniless, and betray his obligation to his fighters. I'm on ESPN, right? All sports are f***ing stopped. You didn't realize how important sports was right. until it was gone. But you're responsible for the sport, and now you can't have in-person events. And I've been building this sport for 23 years. I have 450 employees that I have to take care of who have families that they have to take care of. Like, it was this narrative during COVID that if you didn't run and hide, you were reckless. A lot of these people in this building have been with me for 15 years or more. I care more about money than I do human life. These people have worked hard for me. They would run through walls for me. You were a monster. You didn't care about other people. And I'm always telling them, I love you guys, this and that, we're a team, this and that. The first time the shit hits the fan, I'm gonna start laying you people off in the scariest time in the history of the right. world? Uh-uh. This is America, we, we don't quit, we don't give up, and we definitely don't run and hide in our houses. There was no way I was laying off one employee. Meanwhile, all these other companies are looking at their bottom line and f***ing whacking yeah, everybody. Oh, we, laying I all know. the people off. Companies start laying off big percentages of the workforce. They don't know how long the quarantines are gonna remain in effect. Every week, yeah. I would send out a video to my employees. Relax. Don't be scared. Don't worry about anything. Enjoy the quality time you have. If you or anybody you love gets sick, make me the first phone call. We'll get them taken care of. If you need food, Toilet paper was a big deal then. If yep, you need yep, toilet paper, yep. call me. So you paid everybody? Paid everybody. If I would have had to take my own money out of the bank and keep these people here, I would have done whatever it took to not lay one person off at this company. So that introduces a math problem, though, into your life, because you've got a lot of money going out and no money coming in. So right. what do you do? This whole ship goes down and we all go down together? Or not at all? You figure out how to put on events. You figure out how to... How to keep the show alive and keep it going. I start looking, why can't I get an island? Why can't I take this thing somewhere in the <laughs> desert somewhere and we build a true bubble? I've also secured an island. I've got an island. They're testing in Abu Dhabi. Why can't we test? Well, if they were doing testing, we could do testing here. It was just a matter of figuring out how to do it. I'm gonna build a lab and I'm gonna hire scientists. I'm gonna get scientists in here and we're gonna figure out how to test. The infrastructure is being built right now. We're gonna do all of our international fights on this island. I wouldn't even tell the media where we were holding events because these scumbags would start calling and trying to get it shut down. So you went to Abu Dhabi. White Island is uh, on Yaz Island in Abu Dhabi. And it was really the only true bubble that existed in sports. But this thing is as bad as they're saying it is. We're all dead anyway. Are, you, are we gonna hide from a virus? That's where I'm at. I'm not thinking, oh my God, this is, let's hide. I got a really nice house, brother, and I'm good. Right. I can go hide. Right, right, right. Yeah. I, I can hide for a very long time Damn, and, man. and be good. M my employees can't. They can't. Media does nothing. They, 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 they never built anything. Uh, nobody depends on them for a paycheck, but all they do is sit back and criticize. Negativity on, on, on social media. Dana White is an epidemic on his hands. Negativity from the media. Epidemiologist blasts UFC President Dana White. Negativity from whoever they are that are out there talking shit. I took a lot of heat 
took a lot of bullets. I love that shit. Some people fold yeah. under adversity. I eat that shit for breakfast. Dana was able to overcome a worldwide shutdown, ignore the media, and not only pay his employees and fighters, but put on some of the greatest events we'd ever experienced and grew the sport at the scariest moments of our lives. Fight Island is a symbol that Dana White will stop at nothing to keep alive three simple letters and an old octagon. I understand that Dana is abrasive and blunt, but would you want anyone else to run this company? I mean, the owner of the WWE almost owned the UFC in instead of Dana. Vince McMahon, from what I hear, his son, Shane, mm -hmm. wanted to buy the UFC. Vince had the opportunity to buy it, and Vince said, yeah, no, we're not gonna buy it. Look, Dana is far from perfect, but we can't say he isn't passionate about this sport. I get in here every day, 8.30, 9 o'clock. I leave every day at 7.30, quarter to eight. I could care less about money. I don't care about money. I love this sport, I love this brand, and I love what we're doing. My business is fight. Since 1993, martial arts has evolved more than it has in the last 10,000 years. And it's continuing to evolve because of the UFC. I love what I do, I love this business, I love everything about it. There's still fights that I'll watch and when it's over I go, what the f do I do for a living? This is crazy. This is madness. We can't say he doesn't care about the athletes. He told me that he was he was about to be homeless, so that ain't gonna happen. We're the first fight promoters in the history of combat sports to actually provide uh, health insurance for our fighters. We're the first ones to ever open a performance institute for the athletes where they eat and get food, they get all their supplements here, it's all free. Training, conditioning is all free. Uh, physical therapy, it's all free. And the thing we gotta ask ourselves when we look at the story of Dana White is, did he do what he set out to do? I knew from the time that I was 19 years old that I wanted to be in the fight business. Now, I'm a big believer in the American dream. When you figure out who you are, and what you want to do, and you devote your life to it like, like a maniac, like you're all in on this thing, and you manifest, most of these people end up doing what they say they're going to do and being who they say they're going to become. If this wasn't happening right now, I'd be in the fight business anyway. I wanted to learn every single piece of the business, and I did everything. I mean, I trained, I boxed, I, I uh, refereed, I worked corners, I did everything. The things that I focus on is the live event, on television and in-house. New up and coming talent. And putting on the best fights that I can possibly put on. Those are the core of the business. Now if I stay focused on that, you can't f this thing up. This business is so massive. We have a video game business. We have a gym business. The list goes on and on. I could tell you all these ancillary businesses that spin off <clears throat> from the UFC. How many employees? 350. Worldwide, what are you touching? 400. Uh-huh. What do you Almost think? Almost seven, 800 fighters under contract. I have my people that I need to take care of, which is my family. I have my employees who, who I need to take care of. I have my fighters that I need to take care of. Outside of that, you guys all knock yourself out. What do you care about? Uh, winning. One of my biggest hobbies is I like to win. We've done so many things in the fight business that have never been done yet, and we continue to do that. I'll outwork anybody. Uh -huh. Nobody's gonna outwork me. For me, there's no days off. There's no holidays. I'm like the broke dude who got rich. Do you feel like you're winning? Yeah. But the one thing that I can always say that I was very lucky is I always knew what I wanted to do. I tell young people now all the time, I definitely tell my kids, if you are even remotely a savage, you'll, you'll run these people over. I don't want to take anything away from him for what he's done for MMA and the UFC. There's two sports that are global. That is soccer, soccer and, us. and I think it's pretty amazing the things he's been able to do with MMA and the UFC. You guys just did a, a different deal. And the UFC has officially been sold. The UFC announced it has been sold for a four billion dollar deal. Does it all come at once or is there, are there installments? Does it come, is there a giant novelty Payment. check? When we sold, it was a completely different feeling for me. Everybody that came in that was making offers to buy the UFC, yeah. the one stipulation was that I had to stay. I would love to see Dana change. I really would. I would like to see him become a better person. We're all humans, man. We're going to make mistakes. It's how you handle yourself after you make that mistake. You still love yourself? Of course I do. Everything in life is about timing, and the timing couldn't have worked out better for us with this thing. Not just Adam Corrigan's wedding, you know, Bob Meyerowitz being financially in trouble at that time with the UFC. 
you know, the demise of boxing. Could the UFC be where it is today without Dana White? I'm not a sports guy. I'm a fight guy. I mean, Dana has has become the face of the UFC. It's been an amazing ride. It's it's uh, it's a fun business, and uh, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. He is a great promoter. Lorenzo would tell you he said it a million times, and he says it to me all the f time. He's like, "You were me you were put on this f earth." Yep to do this. Right. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. This is what I've always wanted to do and it got it worked out. Dana, congratulations on your first show. That's got to feel good. We're very excited. We got a sellout crowd here, 5,000 people. You were the only, pretty much the only uh, sports figure that was essential in, yeah. uh, in all of sports. Basically what we want to do is we want to make this the Super Bowl of mixed martial arts. Obviously I hopefully have built a business that will last many, many years after I'm dead. We want to make it more fan friendly. We want to get the crowd involved in it. And we want to bring back the best fighters in the world. If, if and when I ever leave. With leadership from guys like Lorenzo Fertitta, his brother Frank, of course, Dana, the future looks bright, bright, bright for the UFC. The UFC will be very different when I'm gone. It'll be different. Thank you to my members and patrons. Become one yourself to get your name in the credits and subscribe because the UFC management to give me a world title shot. Please, I want the bell so bad.